Hello, I'm Neil Hermes and welcome to my weekly bird wrap where I talk about the things that have been happening in the bird world in the last week and stories about things about birds in Australia and from around the world. Uh, it's got, just before I start, it's going to be great to be able to do these talks for you from other places than just nearby to my home when we get out of COVID. So I'm looking forward to giving you some of these wraps from some of my favourite locations around Canberra, around Australia and potentially around the world. So keep watching. My first story today is about a, uh, an announcement that was made this week, which was about a, a fossil eagle that has been identified from a lake uh, near Lake Frome in northern South Australia. Um, uh, Ellen Mather, uh, a PhD from Flinders University, has described this enormous uh, bird of prey, almost the size of a, a wedge-tailed eagle or a golden eagle. And they found the fossils in uh, sand beds around a salt lake uh, in Central Australia. This bird, 24 million years ago, was living in a wet forest around a luxurious lake. And Ellen's been able to put the story together about this, this particular uh, a bird at, from looking at a number of things. They looked at the pollen that was in the sediments where the bird was. They looked at the skeleton. They looked at the geology. And they've been able to put this story together of a goshawk-like enormous eagle that lived in the forest 24 million years ago eating things like early forms of koalas and possums from the trees in this forest. Um, Ellen's named the bird, um, the scientific name means ancient bird of the forests. But I spoke to Ellen yesterday and we decided it needed a better common name that we could call it. Um, and with a, with a, a, a friend of mine, a, a scientist, Dick Shoddy, we came up with the name Giant Forest Hawk for this amazing bird. You can see a painting that they've done of the bird on the website. So have a look at that. The discovery of the giant forest hawk, a 24 million year old fossil from Central Australia. Amazing work by Ellen and her colleagues in South Australia. My second story today is about the migrants arriving. In Southern Australia, this is the time of the year when we get many of our migrants coming back to have their breeding seasons or their off seasons here with us. And I've mentioned species like um, Latham snipe, the various waders that come from Northern Hemisphere to Australia for their summers. I've mentioned before uh, species like the beater that comes back. So this, this week and the next week or two, we get a whole range of these uh, migrants back. And a bird that I've got a project on, which is the rainbow bee eater, has arrived back in Southern Australia. I heard a small flock of them fly over me a couple of days ago and they're coming back to nest along the riverbanks in the Murray, the Murrumbidgee, the Lachlan um, and the Victorian rivers in su southern Australia where they nest in the banks of the, of the rivers and they, they'll have eggs in about late November, early December and I have a small project on the Murrumbidgee which I'll bring you a story about on my weekly wrap um, in weeks to come. My next story this week is going to be about gang gang cockatoos and I've been asked to go on radio tomorrow to talk about this matter of the possible um, declaration of endangeredness of gang gang cockatoos. So have a look at my radio broadcast which will be on the website. The question that's being asked at the moment is, is the gang gang cockatoo an endangered species? And the federal government has uh, set up a review uh, which people can put submissions to and next year, the federal government will make a determination as to whether or not the gang gang cockatoo has reached the point where it's believed to be endangered. Now, the sorts of things that they look at in terms of working out whether something is endangered is how many birds are left in the wild? How many, what are the pressures on the birds in the wild? And are the pressures increasing on the birds in the wild to the point where they may not survive um, into the future? It's a difficult thing to measure, and what happens is submissions are put in, scientists look at the information, and then eventually the federal minister under the federal act has to determine whether or not the species is endangered. And there's a number of categories within the, um, within the act. It can be found that a species is already extinct. It can find it that a, a species is extinct in the wild, but still held in captivity it could find that a species is critically endangered 
or endangered. And depending on what's determined, certain actions then have to be taken to help that bird. Now in the ACT, the gang gang cockatoo was regularly seen and many people regard it as relatively common. But it occurs north along the tablelands up to Sydney and almost up to the Hunter Valley. It also occurs in the south, down through Victoria and used to occur in Tasmania. It's always been rare on the extremities of its range. But the question that's being asked at the moment is, have the huge fires that we had early this year affected so much of the bird's habitat that it now has reached across all states, ACT, New South Wales, Queensland uh, and Victoria, a point where it might be declared endangered. And under federal legislation, they can have a, a, a declaration across the whole area. Interestingly, in New South Wales, the New South Wales has already declared that the gang gang is a vulnerable species because each state has its own classifications. But that's what's happening with the gang gang cockatoo at the moment. I'm happy to say that I've been involved in the past with some citizen science work. Back in 2014, we did some research work um, and a paper was written by my colleagues, Chris Davey and Kathy Isles on the status of gang gangs, uh, which found that in the ACT reporting rates were pretty consistent over the last decade or two. But um, this review that's now being done into gang gangs um, over the next months and reporting next year will make a determination about whether or not gang gangs have reached a stage where we should be concerned about them. And of course the, the factors are that their tree hollows are being removed and that their feeding sites are being removed by things like fire. My last story uh, this week is about uh, a species which has been declared extinct in the United States. This week the United States government announced that it would, it's proposing to declare the ivory-billed woodpecker a beautiful big black and white woodpecker, the largest woodpecker that occurred in the United States. This massive black and white bird with this big red crest. It's been determined that probably this bird is now extinct in the United States. It used to occur in Cuba, it used to occur in the southern states from Texas through to Florida, um, and officially was last seen in 1944. But to prove, to prove that something is, is extinct is very difficult. As you might have seen with a story I did uh, a, a few weeks back on the night parrot in Australia, where we rediscovered it after 100 years. The ivory-billed woodpecker has been uh, said to have been seen again as late as the 1990s. So one of the issues they're going to have in the United States before they can officially declare the ivory-billed woodpecker extinct is many people will say that they believe it still exists and we're producing information to try and keep the hunt for this extraordinary big woodpecker. It was a species that used to live or may still live in the swamp forests of Louisiana and Missouri. Um, it, uh, it loved big old dead pine trees which it nested in with its huge bill it was able to open up the cavities. A magnificent bird. So whether or not this species is extinct or not is going to be the subject of quite a lot of discussion in the United States over the next couple of months. There's a couple of other quick things I'd like to mention at the end of my wrap this week. One is the scrub end story that we did with a nest in the pannery of the bike. We have a video of that site um, up on um, my blog uh, which you can have a look at and see the bird going in and out. It's a really cute little story about the scrub wren nesting. And the second little extra that I'd just like to mention this week is about the peregrine falcons. Last week we talked, I talked about how they survived the earthquake and um, I put a, a blog on my website about that. If you visit the blog on my website and go to the live feed, this week the chicks have hatched out. So you can go to the live feed and look, look at the chicks today. Um, and it's so cute to see these four little chicks in the nest. And one of the things about chicks of a falcon is that they have a special title. It's a bit like signets of uh, baby swans. Baby falcons are called Eyas, E-Y-A-S, and it's an old falconry term, but um, we now have these uh, young Iases, E-Y-A-S-S-E-S, Iases, um, in their nest uh, underneath the peregrine falcon on the Collins Street building, and you can view that live on the web feed uh, in my blog, which you can see on the website. So thanks for joining us, joining me this week, and I uh, hope to see you again soon.